Seth Lehrer is a distinguished professor of literature and dean of arts and humanities. His research and teaching interests include medieval and renaissance studies, comparative philosophy, the history of scholarship, and children's literature. Tonight, he'll discuss the history of reading, the technologies of literacy, and the social impact of literature and language. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be here. My laboratory is the library. But because I work in a library, it does not mean that my work does not have a social impact. My concern is the relationship between literacy and technology, how changes in the media of communicating literature and the ideas of the mind have a direct impact on the nature of those ideas and what I call our vernacular consciousness. When I work in libraries, I encounter strange and rare things, like this scroll from ancient Greece. In the Greek, the Roman, and the ancient Hebrew traditions, you did not write in a bound book, you wrote on a scroll. And scroll writing is very different from book writing. It cannot be accessed, if you will, at random. You must open it up. Scrolls are large things. They were used for the storage of canonical literature, Homer, Virgil, the Torah in the Hebrew tradition. Now, if you were a student and you were sitting in class, you couldn't write on a scroll this large. Instead, what you worked on was this tablet, a set of wooden boards covered with wax and then a stylus. And you would take notes on the wax and then you would transfer it or memorize it and then you would melt the wax again and you would reuse it over and over and over again. And so think of this as the ancient version of a kind of etch-a-sketch or blackboard in which you could have information conveyed to you in a temporary way. These boards, when they were bound together, were called something called a codex. A codex is a bound volume. The early Christians in the first centuries of the Christian era realized that codexes, bound books, were smaller, cheaper, easier to hide than the large scrolls that were used for Greek and Roman and Hebrew texts. And also, they signaled a fundamental difference in the ideologies of reading. A Christian book is a book like this. A Roman book, a Greek book, a Jewish book was a rolled up thing, and the Latin word for that rolled up thing is a volume. So when we talk about volumes, we talk about rolled up things. What can you do with a bound book that you can't do with a scroll? Saint Augustine, the great father of the Christian church in the year 394, talks about how he was converted finally to true belief. And the way he was converted, this is a much later picture, but the way he was converted is this. He tells a story that he was having a crisis of faith and he picked up a copy of the scriptures and he threw himself down underneath a fig tree in a garden and he opened the book at random and he read, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lust and wantonness, not in quarrels and rivalries. And as he says, I marked the place with my finger or by some other sign and I closed the book. You can only do that with a bound book. And Augustine's point, and my point as well, is that it is the physical medium of literacy that is inseparable from the personal experience and social meaning of the text. The transitions from the scroll to the bound codex not only affected the physicality of reading, it affected the ideologies and the ideas of reading. Once you bound an Old Testament and a New Testament together, you could do what was called figural or allegorical reading. You could open the book into the Old Testament and read a story of a father and a son walking up a hill with the son carrying a load of wood on his back ready for sacrifice. And you could put your finger in that place of the book and then flip ahead to another story of a son walking up a hill with a load of wood on his back 
waiting to be sacrificed for his father. This is allegory. This is figural reading. This is the essence of Christian understanding, and it could only be done with a bound book. Under this rubric, I talk about the manuscript. The word rubric comes from the Latin word meaning to write something in red. And in medieval manuscripts, what you wrote in red were chapter titles or headings or important things. And in the 14th century, the great Italian poet Dante began his book called The New Life, in which he says, in that part of the book of memory, which is the first one which is possible to read, one finds the rubric, here begins my new life. Dante imagines memory as a bound book, and he imagines the chapters of our memory rubricated by the scribe of the imagination. And this compels us to think not just of memory as a book, but of the world as a book. At the end of Dante's Divine Comedy, he says, looking at the spirit of the Godhead in paradise, in its depth I saw going inside, bound by love into a single volume. That which before had been expressed as scattered pages throughout the universe. The world is a bound book. And what I'm getting at is that throughout the history of Western literary culture, books provide us not only with the media of understanding, but with the metaphors of our imagination. Technology is not simply the bearer of ideas, it provides us with imaginative ideas. And so, when we see ourselves now in a comparable moment of literate transition, scroll to codex, or had I enough time I could tell you about the transition from manuscript to printed book, we now live in an age of transition from print to digital literacy. What is the relationship between digital literacy and our habits of reading and reception, writing and the imagination? Throughout history, once the bound book became the norm, one quite literally could curl up with a book. Bound books are cradled, they are engaged with. When you read, you look down. What I would say is that the experience of reading a book is absorptive. By contrast, when people started to read on screens, the experience was what I call theatrical. That is, you did not look down, you looked out. You did not cradle the book in your hand, but you looked out at the screen. It generated a different physical engagement with texts. This different physical engagement deeply affected the way in which we think of the text, the way in which we access literature, and the way in which our cognitive processes engage the eye, the head, the hand, and the heart. And so it may not be an accident that in our digital age what we look for is a simulacrum of the book, a recreation of the experience of curling up with something that we can look down at. That is, we have now the e-reader, and these e-readers have names like Kindle, and nook, the kindle that kindles the imagery of intellectual fire, and the nook where you curl up in the back. And as I say this, I must take at least 30 seconds to say that at this moment I find myself channeling my grandfather's voice, thinking where he says to me, where'd you put the kindle, is it in the nook? And I have this image <laughs> of this e-reader as emboldened with this notion of a man who came to this country who sought to kindle as an experience, not as a nook, but, or let me put it this way, can we have the St. Augustine moment with a kindle? Can you be inspired in the way Augustine was with the electronic text? Let me look back a few years when I was teaching at another university up north. In 2004, I received this email from a student, and I reproduce it exactly. Prof Lehrer, on my way out to class today, I got a piece of glass stuck in my foot. It was bleeding and hurting a lot, so I had to come back and clean it up. Sorry about the absence, but I'll get the notes from someone. Apologies. Right, sure there are misspellings, bad capitalization, all of them hallmarks of an email style designed not to mime speech, but to create what I call the illusion of intimacy. Email <laughs> articulates a studied informality a carefully framed indifference to the rigors of epistolarity. <laughs> yeah. 
I have a PhD. I just want you to know <laughs> that I can say stuff like that and get away with it. And when I teach my undergraduates in Ravel College, I talk to them and they ask me about these things. And I say, you have to understand I am bilingual. I am bilingual in English and in PhD. And so <laughs> I read this, and because I have a PhD, I thought to myself, Prof. Lara, on my way out to class today, I got a piece of glass stuck in my foot. It was bleeding and hurting a lot. So I had to come back and clean it up. Sorry about the absence, but I'll get the notes from someone. Apologies. I could not but think of William Carlos Williams' great poem of 1919. <laughs> This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which we were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were so delicious, so sweet, and so cold. <laughs> Both this student's email and William Carlos Williams' poem are, in essence, notes tacked onto the kitchen walls of life. They are essays in absence, and they are both letters of apology. We live in a world of apology. How could we not explain what linguists call uptalk, the way in which every sentence now ends as if it were actually a question? And because we are constantly apologizing for what we're saying, we are constantly living in a world in which the digital does not enable the emotive. BRB, be right back. DWPKOTL, deep, wet, passionate kiss on the lips. GGN, <laughs> gotta go. This is actually a transcription from actual texts I have received. I L I C I S C O M K, I laughed, I cried, I spilled coffee on my keyboard. And <laughs> T 2 UT, talk to you tomorrow. These may seem risible but they are exactly like the ancient cuneiform texts <laughs> in which we use ideographic signs, in which communication is designed to be coded. If there is a future for communication in the digital world, what I would say is it will create a codified, stratified way of communicating. Communicating would be code. Communicating may no longer be, as it was for me, the experience of complete sentences. I could used to be able to put my finger in a book. I could bring a book to class and show a student that William Carlos Williams wrote a poem about stolen fruit, and that Augustine throwing himself underneath the fruit tree was as figural experience as stealing plums from an icebox. These days, I walk into a class with my Macintosh, and I realize that the bite out of the apple is now not succumbing into sin, but a taste of knowledge digitally richer than anyone imagined. And I'd like to believe that up there in heaven, Steve Jobs is looking down <laughs> and finding that it is good. <laughs>